China and Japan um, during this, you know, uh, you know, 15th and 16th century period. All right, so a little quick review of the Chinese dynasties. I think it's always good to go back and do a little quick summary. So remember the first dynasty that we covered was the Shang Dynasty, 1750 BCE. Nothing really that significant. The only thing that, you know, uh, that maybe that you might want to connect with is the idea of ancestor veneration, um, you know, as, as, a, as a religious aspect of that dynasty. Um, also, the, the use of the oracle bones, but there wasn't a lot there in terms of, you know, organized government. Um, the Zhao dynasty, that's the first dynasty that, you know, you're going to see a little more historical information about. Around 1040 BCE. Uh, that's where we start to see the, the uh, you know, the mandate of heaven is introduced. Uh, feudalism, uh, really, you know, the, it's the first feudal um, society. Um, it's the Iron Age, right, where the Chinese start to imp imp implement iron uh, tools and iron weapons. That's important. And that's where we see the birth of Confucianism and Taoism, and this is the Warring States period, right? So those two, um, you know, uh, systems developed in response to, right, the, the chaos and the war and conflict of the Zhao. It's the Qin Dynasty that follows. That's a big one to 20 BCE. Uh, that goes, I believe, closer to um, you know more modern history. Legalism is established under the under Qin Shi Huangdi, who's the first emperor, right? So legalism is another response to the old Warring States period. Remember, uh, Qin was a pretty harsh ruler, um, but he did you know kind of unify China. Uh, he centralizes the government. Uh, he develops infrastructure. Um, canals, roads. He standardizes uh, script, weights and measures, and he abolishes local laws to, again, unify China. So he's given, and we have, don't forget the terracotta figures, right? Where there was this fabulous art, right? Um, the life-size terracotta figures that were um, buried with him. Uh, that's followed by the Han. This is the one that I think is really the most significant. Uh, 141 BCE to um, uh, you know, earlier, you know, going into the new period of time, you know, the new, um, you know, after Christ period. Uh, we see great expansion, probably the most expansion of any Chinese dynasty. The Silk Roads are established. That's something that's very important. Uh, they introduced the civil service exam and the idea of meritocracy. Uh, goods like paper are, are, are developed, the first paper, and the junk, which is that touring or traveling ship that the technology will eventually be absorbed by Europeans. Uh, we also have some, some inner conflict with the Yellow Turban Rebellion. If you remember, Wang tries to uh, take land from the, the noble class and give it to the poor. And there's a conflict between the lower class and the noble class. And then obviously, uh, disease, smallpox helped devastate the Han in addition to nomadic invasion. The Sui follows 581C. That's where we see the birth of the Grand Canal. And... Um, uh, the long wall. So I think there was a wall, a natural wall developed during the Han Dynasty, and that wall will continue during the Sui. Not the great wall we see today, but kind of the beginnings of a, of a wall. And remember, that means that because of invasion, they need to defend themselves. Uh, the city of Hangzhou becomes a major uh, urban center because of that Grand Canal. All right, the Tang follows a lot for the Tang. Uh, 618 CE, um, you know, don't forget what else is happening around 618 CE, right? The Roman Empire has fallen, but we see the birth of the, the Byzantine Empire, right? Those those Islamic empires, the Umayyad and Abbasid Empire. So it's all happening at once. Um, you know, the early Middle Age period in Europe is developing. So in China, we have a tributary system, right? The kowtow or the bowing to the, the, the noble or the Chinese, um, you know, emperors um, as respect. Um, you might see a cartoon or a picture of that, right? Uh, equal field system, which is a continuation of what Wang tried to do. That was important economically. Uh, they, they introduced uh, champa or fast ripening rice. Um, the compass, gunpowder, and wood block printing are new innovations that are very important. And we start to see the first banking system, right? Uh, paper money or flying cash is established. Uh, increased emphasis on education, right? Um, especially to help develop that, uh, the, that government system. And this is where we see the spread of Buddhism. It's during the Tang Dynasty. And we see the emergence of Zen Buddhism and Neo-Confucianism. And remember, Zhuang Zhang is the Chinese missionary who 
goes to Indy and brings back Buddhism. So a lot going on. That's an important dynasty as well. Then we, we, we go into the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. Um, this is where education is expanded to the lower classes to make them more competitive, uh, help them on the civil service exam. And it's important. We see the scholarly gentry emerges. It's, it's a new class, right? So they're right under the ruling class, right? They're going to be right below that class um, they are going to be the, the, the study, you know, they're going to study Confucianism. They're going to be, um, they'll take positions in government. They'll actually um, run the military, which was a problem at times because they didn't have the military experience. Uh, this is also where we see the commercial revolution, right? Increased trade, silk especially, and porcelain, right? That's proto-industrialization. Um, iron, uh, you know, we see the beginning of steel, not smelting of steel. That's important. Um, and the emergence of guns, right? It's this time where we see the, the, the growth of guns. And foot binding emerges uh, to reinforce the patriarchal system. All right, so following the, the Song dynasty, you're going to have the Yuan dynasty. And that is the Chinese dynasty that was governed by the Mongols, right? The Kublai Khan, uh, uh, Kal uh, Kanate. And remember, it's here where tr you know, Chinese traditions continue. Confucianism, uh, but remember the the Mongols govern China directly, um, and Mongols are going to have the better positions. Um, they're going to uh, you know um, kind of move away from the civil service exam. So a lot of Chinese traditions do go away. Not all of them, right? Uh, art is 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 maintained. Um, again, I think Confucianism is still an important aspect of their society, right? Um, in terms of uh, gender roles continue, but it's the way it's it's really who's ruling, and now you have the Mongol, the Mongol, the Mongolians who are now ruling. Uh, that's followed by the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. Um, very important dynasty. Um, the silk trade continues to prosper. Um, you know, the Silk Roads have been rebuilt by the Mongols. It's during this time though we start to see. The Chinese trade overseas, right? Uh, two cities, Beijing and Nanjing, emerge. They're, they're beautiful cities with, with infrastructure and architecture. And again, as I mentioned, it's a return to old ways. So now, you know, traditional Chinese are back in power. The Mongols are no longer there. Um, so you're going to see uh, Confucianism, uh, not that it was ever gone, but it's going to be even more important, the civil service exam will be reinstituted, a national school system will emerge, and that Chinese bureaucracy will, which, which didn't go away, but now, you know, that scholarly gentry class will be back in power. Um, and again, they tried to completely erase Mongol influence. Uh, Mongol clothing was, was, was rejected, names were discouraged, so uh, that was the period of time that the Chinese tried to kind of um, wipe away. Uh, it's also, uh, during this time, there was great expansion uh, into Mongolia, ironically, Central Asia, um, and the Great Wall of China was built. So the wall that we would see today is, is, is being built during the Ming Dynasty, and that's a response to the Mongol attacks, right? They, they don't want that to happen. Um, so it, it's, they've learned their history a bit. Um, all right. Uh, so Zheng He, uh, we, we've kind of referenced him in our last, uh, when we did the DBQ about uh, exploration. He is considered the greatest, at least Asian explorer. Um, he made seven voyages, didn't go as far as Columbus or as far as the Portuguese, but he did have a huge fleet. Large ships were tr tr huge. Uh, they dwarfed uh, Columbus's ships. He had 300 ships on his journey. So he was... Um, an explorer that was probably, um, you know, he had a larger exploration force. Um, and a lot of it was to display the might of the Ming Dynasty. So when he would, you know, go into India or Arabia, um, he would uh, require or expect tribute from uh, the, the, the communities he would kind of land in. He didn't take over, but, you know, he did have gunpowder and guns, so cannons. So he was, you know, an intimidating force when arriving on, you know, the, um, the coast of Africa and Arabia. Um, what was his impact? One, he opens up new markets. Here's, here's his journey, right, into Africa, uh, Arabia. Um, exotic treasures, you know, he's going to bring things from Arabia um, and Africa into China. Um, a better understanding of the world, right? The Chinese really were not 
you know, remember they relied on, you know, a lot of their goods were, were, were made it to Europe through middlemen, um, you know, Byzantine traders, eventually, uh, you know, the Ottoman traders. You know, the Chinese traders didn't go all the way to Europe. They would trade their goods in the middle, right, middlemen. Um, now they're, they're actually going to far-reaching places. And that did inspire Chinese, at least early on during this dynasty, to, to leave and explore. But eventually, the Chinese would begin to discourage this. And they recognized that Ming's adventures, while profitable, might over time undermine Chinese culture. So, you know, the you know, leaders of, of the Ming eventually grew to uh, ban the construction of large ships. And again, eventually discouraged travel outside of China in the 14th century, would be the 1300s. Um, you know, again, the idea would be, you know, to, it would threaten, you know, exposing China to outside influences would, would threaten their traditional ways, you know, their Confucianist um, culture. All right, um, so a little about the Portuguese in Asia. Um, we know that, you know, da Gama is the first Portuguese sailor, or European for that matter, to make it to Asia by boat, right? He goes around Africa, and that was significant. They established... You know, you know, the Spanish are going to really establish colonies in the Americas. Portuguese are going to have a huge influence in Asia. They're going to have forts or trading posts in the Persian Gulf, uh, in Western India, and all the way into Malaysia. Malacca, that's a, a famous trading city in Malaysia that they're going to control. And they're going to basically have a trade monopoly over the spice trade. Um, remember, Indian traders were not interested in sailing overseas. And eventually the Chinese would kind of shut down their exploration. So it's really the Portuguese that are dominating this region from a trading standpoint. Uh, there was some conversion to Christianity, not a lot, but some. Um, the scholarly gentry was obviously concerned about the exposure to the West. So those who were converted were probably poor Chinese, right? Peasantry, um, maybe merchants who were, you know, trading with, with Portuguese. But the, the upper class was not, con, you know, converting. Um, gunpowder. So they would trade, you know, they would actually trade Chinese gunpowder into to Japan. They would be, you know, trading with Japan. So that actually was used by the shoguns of Japan to kind of regain control of the empire from the daimyo or the noble class. So there was a huge impact politically from the Portuguese trade. I think that's something to remember that's important. All right, the Qing Dynasty follows. Um, so there was a peasant revolt in 1644 by Ali Xingzheng, and he was Manchurian, or he was from uh, this region right over here. Um, so Manchuria is, is a part of China. It's north, um, eastern China, and the Manchus eventually traveled into you know, central China, and they basically took over. So the Qing dynasty was actually ruled by Manchurian Chinese. Um, kind of like the Mongols taking over in a sense, right? So, uh, you know, the Manchurians were, were not necessarily seen as traditional Chinese, um, mostly in their culture. So they were less tolerant than the Mongols. That was important. And actually the men, Chinese men, then had to wear their hair braided. That was a Manchurian custom. Uh, if you didn't, you were executed. Um, like the Mongols, they put Manchurians into the best job. So again, we see another invasion in a sense. But Manchuria was not an empire like the Mongolian Empire, but it was still um, a group of outsiders. Um, they did maintain Chinese practices like the strong bureaucracy and the civil service exam. So the Qing dynasty would be a dynasty ruled by the Manchurian people. I think that's an important piece to remember. And again, I think it's easy to remember the, the cultural takeover, the braids. Uh, that dynasty would rule for a while. Um, so uh, the Qin, sorry, the Qing empires, emperors, the first one was Kangxi, 1661. Remember, this is after Columbus. I always use Columbus as kind of a, a date, 1492. So now we're getting into really... You know, the American Revolution is 1776, so this is what's happening in China during that time. Um, a lot of expansion. Uh, the Chinese expand their influence into Taiwan, an island uh, south of China, Mongolia, and Tibet. Tibet becomes a Chinese province. Tibet is near India. If you don't know about Tibet, that's where the Dalai Lama once lived many years ago. Um, uh, they were, 
Kang Z was, was tolerant of Catholicism, but his successors were not. So there was a change over time. Um, Jesuit monks were actually very respected by Kang Z uh, because of their interest in learning the language. They respected Confucianism and they taught um, the Chinese people about European science. So there was tolerance on both sides. Um, but again, his successors were not as tolerant. But I would say I would give him points for being tolerant. Um, he definitely uh, promoted education. Um, he promoted public education or an emphasis on schooling for young adults. Um, he had his own dictionary and a collection of books. So um, that, that's, that's a continuation, right, of the Chinese emphasis on, on education. All right, Ch uh, Ch Ch Chin Long, Ch I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, 1735 to 1795. This is during the American Revolution. Very well run government, tax collections continued. A um, lot of military campaigns. That's a continuation, right, of Chinese expansion. Um, brutal, um, brutal military campaigns. Um, mass killings of the Xinjiang, um, a group in China. Um, not that you'd have to remember that, but again, a continuation of expansionist policies. But costly, like most expansion policies were. Um, I would remember this. The, the English were, 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 were very interested in opening up their trade to China. Um, and uh, Chin Long actually was, was open to that. So he did sell trading privileges to, to the English, but he confined it to the city of Canton. And that's important. He wouldn't allow the British to trade in all of the cities or all of the ports, but one port. And that actually frustrated the Chinese, uh, the, the British. Um, and actually, eventually, you're going to see some conflict in, in the next unit between the British and the Chinese. Um, a lot of corruption during this time because of the high taxes. There was a, a, a rebellion, the White Lotus Rebellion, to restore the Ming Dynasty that resulted. Kind of a civil war, not a peasant rebellion. More of a... Um, more of a civil war between uh, different regions. All right, so what were some economic changes? Again, uh, industry is continuing to grow. Uh, again, more proto-industrialization. Uh, it, it had to do with the silk production, silk workshops, for example. Uh, we're not talking about you know, iron mills or, or steel mills like you'd see in Europe or textile mills. But uh, for the Chinese, they were more industrialized than any time beforehand. But they were still very agricultural. Um, as population was growing, there was less land. So there were land limits. Um, and that forced many peasants to work in these uh, silk workshops. Uh, exports continued to grow. It's tea and silk uh, were definitely major items that were um, attractive to Europeans. Um, and they would. the Chinese were very interested in silver. So they would purchased these goods not for, say, in exchange for European goods, but they sold these goods for silver. Um, and there were taxes on uh, traded goods, so there was that strong central government that taxed uh, goods, not, on, not only the peasantry or the merchants, but also the goods themselves. And those silk workshops were growing in, in, in importance, but peasants were beginning to work for wages. There's an important piece, right? Um, they were actually, you know, becoming more traditional laborers now, right, that you'd see in Europe. Not making much money, but they were making some uh, currency. All right, Chinese society, what continues is this reliance on Confucianism. Uh, remember the idea of revering your elders, uh, you know, the emphasis on family over the individual, um, and then obviously, you know, the size of the family, right? Uh, you'd have extended families uh, living together. So that was important. Women, not much change here. Um, in fact, uh, you know, another new agricultural product was cotton. Um, that just reinforced traditional gender roles. Women were expected to work with their hands. So what would they do? They would spin and weave cotton. Uh, so they were spending less time in the fields, actually, and doing more work in the silk workshops, or again, just spinning cotton. Um, they continue to have a very low status, no education, no divorce, and um, foot binding was a, was a continued practice as well. All right, a little bit about foreign policy. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the Qing emperors were open to trade with Europe or other places but they were suspicious. So they limited trade, at least with England, to one city, Canton. But trade would continue, unlike Japan, that would cut out trade uh, much earlier. The Chinese continued to trade with Europe and other parts of the world into the 18th and 19th centuries. 
Um, the British weren't too happy with that. Uh, the McCartney mission, uh, Lord George McCartney was sent by King George III. Um, that's not King George II who oversaw the American Revolution. I guess that's his son. Um, to negotiate with the Qing, but Qing Long really said no, and he refused to open up trade. And that's just going to develop, you know, what's going to develop are tensions between the English and the Chinese, and that's going to kind of be context to what comes next um, in the uh, 19th century or the 1800s, where you're going to see some 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 conflict between the two sides, um, a little short of war, but pretty intense conflict. Um, wars known as the Opium Wars, actually. We'll get into that later. All right, a little bit about Japan. Remember, Japan heading into the 1100s was 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 not a centralized government. Um, you know, there were times the Taika reforms that tried to, but you know, by 1100, um, the daimyo still were very powerful. Uh, the shogun was the ruler of Japan. Uh, I get confused. There was an emperor, but it was the shogun. Or maybe so I guess the shogun was the emperor. I sometimes get confused, but just for now, the shogun was the ruler, and he often was in conflict with the aristocratic class, right? And and the daimyo were very powerful. They had their samurais or their knights. They were very um, uh, militaristic. Um, they ruled their land uh, under the system of feudalism. So, but but heading into you know 1100, that's going to change, and gunpowder had a lot to do with that. So that gunpowder that was brought to Japan by Portuguese traders would strengthen the, the shogun, or, or not the shogun, but would actually allow three daimyos to actually kind of centralize or um, consolidate power among themselves. So even though the, the shogun isn't ruling necessarily, you're going to have fewer daimyos. So I would say, yes, Japan is centralizing or uniting under the rule of fewer uh, rulers. So there were three uh, daimyos that became uh, very powerful, and one eventually became the shogun. So there was Oda Nobunaga. Um, he used, you know, gunpowder and his samurai to conquer other daimyos. Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Uh, he modernizes Japan, but the one I would remember is Togu Tokugawa Ieyasu, or uh, Tokugawa, and he becomes an actual shogun. He completely centralizes or controls Japan. By 1602, he is uh, no longer competing with the other daimyos. So what does the Tokugawa government look like? He centralizes, and this is this is what you want to remember. It's this government that really brings Japan under a, a, a centralized government. He creates an efficient tax collection system. Um, we see there, uh, the Japanese start to mine their own silver and copper, and that definitely helps them. Um, economically speaking, Japan becomes more urbanized during this 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 rule, um, and what he was able to do. One thing that he did is that he was able to control the daimyos. Um, basically, he would hold their families hostage, and that would force the daimyos to pretty much do whatever he wanted. So the daimyos would control territory called Han, and they would have they would actually have homes in Tokyo and homes in their territory. So when their um, their families were in Tokyo, the shogun was able to kind of hold them hostage. And that forced the daimyos to kind of really do what the, the shogun wanted them to do. So again, what do I remember? It's during the Tokugawa government or the Tokugama rule where the shogun basically controls, you know, the, 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 the nation and centralizes things. So um, the daimyos, you're still going to see a feudal system but the daimyos are going to be much more loyal and, um, I don't want to say subservient, but uh, they're really going to have to, to do what the shogun says. All right, what are some special things? So the samurai warrior will lose some influence. Um, he's still going to be high up in terms of social class, but uh, civil wars reduced their influence. And probably gunpowder did too, right? The shoguns had quite a bit of military strength, and they could basically kind of defeat the samurais in battle. Um, the peasants and farmers were just below that, that um, you know, warrior class. And, you know, we talked about this earlier in China, that the merchants were, were, were considered parasites. They were looked down on because of the profits. Um, they weren't working, right? They were making money off the backs of others. But they were very wealthy. So um, it's not that they were poor, but in terms of respect and influence, they didn't have much. On the bottom, you'd have the eta, the unclean jobs, kind of reminds me. 
of um, you know in India, right? You had the um, the group that would would do all the the, the, the unattractive jobs. I forgot what they were called, um, but that's the Ita or the Eta, one of the two. All right, economically, silk also was the big um, you know product. Uh, silver mines uh, were very uh, beneficial. Uh, banking and paper money would also be evident in Japan during this time. Uh, rice and cotton were also agricultural products. Um, but eventually, and this is important to remember, eventually Japan is going to cut off all trade. Um, initially in the mid-1500s, uh, mid right around Columbus's time, um, you know, trade was welcome, but um, a lot of Christian missionaries were disrespectful. Um, converts to Christianity would destroy Buddhist shrines. Um, so that resulted in a banning. Hideyoshi, um, that second daimyo, would actually ban Christian worship. And by 1630s, um, and then this happens much earlier than in China, all foreigners are expelled, foreign books are prohibited, um, it lim they limit Japanese trade and travel abroad completely by the 17th century, or this time, 1630s. And the, like China, they, they, they ban construction of large ships. So really, by the mid-1600s, Japan is completely isolated from the world. Um, very, um, you know, uh, dependent on, you know, they have their own silver and copper mines. They have products that they can trade between their own different groups. Um, so it, it, Japan becomes more centralized. A shogun becomes the all-powerful ruler. Um, the power of the daimyo and the samurai starts to decline. And uh, eventually, the United States will start to make inroads in there in the 1800s. But at least for now, um, you know, 1630s, 1700s, um, Japan is completely isolated. Um, you know, China would become more isolated over time by the 17th century. Or sorry, by the 18th and 19th centuries. That's it, guys.